I am very proud to welcome Le Rondon here on stage uh, to our talk round. It is um, at first Jan, much better known as uh, the funny guys, and uh, Peter Baumann, who is the editor-in-chief of this marvelous institution, and we will talk a bit about the history, but also about the future and their collection and their scientific work they are doing in re their research work about history of generative art. So please come on stage and uh, join me there. Okay, so um, tell us a bit, uh, of course, f uh, first about Le Rondom, about the mission, how did it start and why did it start? Of course, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Susanna, for including us uh, today. It's really an honor to be here uh, among yeah, so many important uh, people in the generative art space. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for organizing and having Thanks. us. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the history of, of, of uh, Le Rondom, um, so I personally uh, got introduced to NFTs in 2020, um, and within one month uh, after I, I discovered NFTs, um, I discovered generative art. Um, and for me, like within the NFT space, that was like the most beautiful synergy uh, between um, the arts and the blockchain technology, uh, because it really synergizes like extremely well. Um, but back then, I was still uh, at university, I was still studying. Um, in July 2021, uh, I then graduated. Um, and I knew for sure I wanted to work uh, in the NFT space uh, because that's where my obsessions were. Um, and actually at that point in time, uh, I think he's also in the room, uh, Michael Spalter. Uh, I had a discussion with him about what, what should I do next? Uh, should I join a company? Should I start something on my own? Um, he told me like, you should go your own way. Um, you know, why not go for it? Um, but I was still feeling a bit too immature to go my own way. Um, I joined a company called Metaversal, um, and I was there like first investment analyst. Um, but then after a few months, like it became clear to me that I really wanted to focus like solely on generative art. Uh, and that's when the idea of Lorandom came into existence. Um, and together with my friend, uh, Zach Taylor, uh, we started the company. Uh, we you found were some how, how old have you been at that time? Um, I have to tell you, because it was really young. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was 22 uh, at that mo moment in time. Um, yeah, and then Wonderful. we, we <laughs> thank you. Um, then we found some investors, uh, and we also found uh, Peter Baumann, who is now our editor in chief, uh, who joined the team um, in 2022. Um, also, Conrad House, our collection lead. Um, and we also have the pleasure of being advised by, by Anne Spalter, uh, Georg Bach, uh, also Jason Bailey. Um, and yeah, since then, we've been collecting and uh, supporting the generative art space uh, and also producing. Uh, content, which mm -hmm. is led by, by Peter. Peter is also an artist, of course, at first, but uh, you are now editor-in-chief. So how did you migrate? Oh, you are still an artist, of course, but how did you open your profession up to the editor-in-chief? And I think this is quite much of your time that you are working as an editor and not as an artist. So maybe you can tell us about the tension also about that. Uh, yes, thank you. And again, thank you also for, for having me and, and at this wonderful event. It's been really an honor to meet everybody here and, and, and to participate, so, so thank you. Yeah, it's been, right now my focus is definitely on editing and, and at the random. Uh, for the editorial, we, we're trying to uh, contextualize the past or understand the past and curate the present and also look forward to and celebrate the future. So that's that's what we're we're looking to achieve and it, it's <laughs> it covers a lot, but uh, I want to integrate the the history of the movement with what we're doing today and and uh, doing that with the editorial space and also with the, the timeline that I'm working on and maybe we'll talk a bit about that uh, mm -hmm. later on but mm -hmm. uh, uh, but when you are talking uh, we are collecting also the past when does the past begin for Le Rondom? well it, it goes back to the very early days uh, of, of, of computer arts um, yeah as you as you know uh, Susanna we, we had the pleasure of collecting uh, a piece by by Herbert from 1979 um, called Mondrian I think that's one of the the earlier pieces we have collected 
Um, we also have a piece by Ana Livia Cordero from 1974. Um, so I think at the moment that's how far back in the past we have gone. Uh, we are still sticking to, to digitized artworks. Mm -hmm. uh, we're collecting NFTs. Uh, so there's like, of course, some tension there. Um, as we saw yesterday, like in, for example, the presentation of, of, of Margaret Rosen, mm -hmm. there's a lot of amazing work from the 60s uh, or even earlier, uh, but these are all physical artifacts, which we currently uh, do not collect yet. Um, but that's something we do hope to do in the future. So all these problems uh, the museums have with these uh, software coding and, and technic technical things that are no longer working and so on, you, you don't keep them, so you don't have the problem so far. But you would like to go into that field as well, as, as far as I understand. Well, in the future, yes. Yeah, um, in the future. It's a dream. You, you, need, you need dreams for the future, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, are, you are quite young, and so uh, have a long life, and uh, there should be some dreams you know, yeah, <laughs> left. That's also, that's also why it feels, to, to be honest, it feels a bit uneasy to, to be here like at this Charity of Arts Summit, because, of course, like, there are so many pioneers. They've done it for decades. We've been doing it for a few years, so it doesn't really feel like we already belong here, but yeah, we're happy for the invitation, uh, nevertheless. Yeah, well, that's, that was the purpose for me, it, really. Uh, I'm, I, I, I was eager to, to give you an overview of the history to, to see how you are embedded in these uh, thoughts of pioneers and uh, that you belong to them and, and you have a history already. So. Uh, Peter, in, in your editorial work, you don't have to care about what is already collected. You can open the full spectrum. So when does your timeline begin? So how far does it go back? And uh, what do you see as major milestones in that time timeline? Yeah, that's, the timeline goes back almost comically far back into the past. Like, so we the first moment is, uh, 73,000 BCE, uh, and I, I can justify, I think I can justify that. Uh, it, those are some of the, Pixel Boy was talking about early art, or, or early cave paintings and early cave art, and, and some of the earliest from 73,000 73, BCE in South Africa is system-based tiling pattern uh, marks on, on caves. So that's when we start the timeline, uh, when the first evidence of humans using systems for creativity. And we go and follow the mathematic and scientific uh, evolution of, of, of human thought throughout the the next, uh, you know, several tens of thousands of years, but really we we start in on, in earnest with the around 1850 with photography, and uh, move decade by decade uh, into the to the present. And so, from photography, of course, we also uh, we also cover a lot of the early abstraction and chance and art with Dada, uh, and also the. Uh, the origins of electronic art, which is kinetic art and light art, and also the dematerialization of art with uh, that started with Duchamp and and again even with with uh, with Dada, but continued in the 60s with with Fluxus and and new tendencies and and so we uh, we we begin well before there's ever any digital computer, but I think it, that pre-computer history needs to be uh, told. Uh, do you also uh, think about or, or include in, in your timeline um, traditional artists doing algorithmic art like uh, uh, Montrian or also Paul Klee and, and uh, there are others uh, that do algorithmically, th they, they had algorithmic images but they did it by paint and color and traditionally is this a part of you? Yes, definitely. Uh, Bridget Riley with Opart and El Ellsworth Kelly and e all of the all of the painterly geometric uh, abstractionists. We they're they're certainly uh, on the timeline and and uh, and yeah, you're able to most of most of that. So the the first chapter is 70,000 <laughs> 70, years in the past to. Uh, 
1850. So uh, a lot of that uh, is covered in the second chapter, which is from 1850 to uh, basically 1949. Yeah, maybe it's also important to, um, to emphasize that when we built this generative art timeline, uh, like we used a, uh, like a very broad definition of, of generative art. Um, I think the one that we tend to, to use most is the one by Philip Gallanter, um, which basically says that like generative art is when, when the artist uses uh, a system and with a certain degree of autonomy, uh, which results in a completed work of art or, or contributes to a com completed work of art. Um, and of course, that's like a very broad definition. That's also why the, uh, the, the, the timeline is such a broad uh, document. Uh, because it's really about yeah, systems thinking, and it's, it's, it's a very broad definition. Uh, but when we collect generative arts, we do tend to use like a more narrow, um, yeah, more narrow way of seeing uh, generative art space. Uh, just a question to you: When when you talked uh, about autonomous systems, uh, a human or the brain is also a, an autonomous system, or is it is it also included? Well, yeah, that, that's, I guess that's a problem when you use such a broad definition. Uh, I think Frieder also yesterday. Uh, well, I would say yes, because yes. Uh, mm -hmm. when you have generative artists using or working with a pen, uh, the, the autonomous system is working in the brain, but it is on, on paper. The result is traditionally on paper. So I don't have any problems with that. I just wanted yeah. to know how about you. Your first reaction was that you have some problems with that. Being, <laughs> thinking not, of, an, of the brain as an autonomous system. Not, not, not necessarily, no. Um, also because I, I wanted to point out that yesterday, like uh, Frieder mm -hmm. also uh, made it clear that like for him, all art is generative art. I think for a similar reason as, as what, what you describe here. Um, so yes, like we focus on generative art, but the art we collect, it probably is better defined by algorithmic art and AI art, which are subsets of generative art, I would say. Yeah. Could, you, could you agree on that maybe? Uh, it's, uh, the human brain is an autonomous system, but it has two sections. That is more the emotional side and the analytical side, and we are covering mainly the analytical side. Would that be a the possibility to, to describe the autonomous system of a human? Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I mean, there is like Daniel Kahneman talks about thinking fast and slow. And so I, I think there is something to that. Uh, in terms of the brain as a system, I think just in order to make the word systems art or generative art meaningful so that it doesn't cover every single thing, I think it does have to uh, include some element of chance or, or loss of control, uh, a, a loss of control that is, um, that's conscious. So, it's, I think it's giving some control to the system. So it might be difficult to do that within your own brain, but I think it's a fascinating uh, concept. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, Herbert had a clear picture concerning the brain and the autonomous system because he believed in real chance in this world. And he said any creative process in the brain is supported by chains of, of real chance, meaning it comes from somewhere and it's not mathematically definable or predictable, let's say predictable. So anyhow, that's maybe a more philosophic question. You know, I like that kind of questions and I like to ask the questions, you know, I don't have to give the answers. That's much, <laughs> much easier, you know. <laughs> Okay, uh, once again, back to your, to your mission. What, what do you want to achieve, achieve even looking a bit more ahead? So in the next years, what, what are you looking for? Yeah, so we, we describe our mission as like quite broad, quite comprehensive of like um, showing the world that computers can enhance human creativity, that they're not something that needs to be, be feared, that we, that we can embrace them and that they don't like negatively impact our human condition. Um, but in practice, like we hope to build uh, one of the most comprehensive, one of the most uh, relevant um, generative art collections like of this of this time, um, while also contextualizing the art movements um, through through Peter's work um, and yeah, supporting the entire generative art movement and, and pushing the space forward. 
So you mentioned uh, Anne and Michael Spalter. I'm, I'm very happy that they were here yesterday. It's not so often that this happens, uh, that they are on, on conferences like that. Um, so I really appreciate that. And you mentioned that they are also supporting you in, in uh, mentally at, uh, at, with, with the collection. So is it, is it something like the 2.0 part of the big collection of uh, generative art? I think it would be dangerous to call it 2.0 because it kind of would mean that it's like a more advanced version or like taking it to the next step. Um, the Spalters have always been like a very big inspiration for us. Um, it was like through seeing Spalter Digital and their collection uh, that we realized that um, yeah, it's possible to, to build an ambitious collection, uh, to focus on one category, contextualize it really well. Um, and back in 2022, uh, there was not really anyone doing it, like in the NFT space. Uh, a lot of collectors, they were kind of, yeah, they were collecting a lot of things, like they were um, mixing profile pictures with arts, um, with metaverse land, like it was a very, a very strange time. Um, and it was definitely because of the spalters that we saw, like, like it can be different, can, like we can build can, something can be done comprehensive. in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, now, yesterday, uh, the two told uh, that they are very open to, to borrow things, uh, physical works, to institutions, to shows, to museums, or make own exhibitions, of course, as well. So uh, how about you? Uh, what is, uh, is it just online available or would you also give your your material for uh, exhibitions museums and so on is it a strategy or is it just if somebody is asking then he will get something or do you say no you don't get it we we would be honored to to show the art we collect um, at, at different institutions uh, i think the like in practice like institutions are currently less interested in the art that we collect than they are in the uh, the arts the spalters have collected. Sure. Um, but actually, like I think Michael also mentioned it yesterday, uh, there will be a Tate Modern exhibition uh, later this year. Um, and one of the artworks we collected um, last year will be included in that exhibition. Um, so I hope we can do a lot more uh, of public showcasing in the future. But you only collect uh, dig digital work, uh, meaning uh, digital work, or do you also collect physical work once in a while? So it's mainly digital. Uh, I would say like 95% of what we collect is, is only digital work and it only exists on, on screens. Um, but sometimes we also collect um, physical work. Um, it's still quite limited. Um, but for example, um, Marcel Schwitlik, uh, like he creates fantastic physical artworks. Um, he also issues a, a token. Uh, which kind of serves as like the, the cer certificate of, uh, of authenticity. Um, and we have collected uh, quite a bit of his, his artwork. So all, all those artists who are moving in between the physical and the digital world. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, I, I, I almost forgot. You have a presentation, Peter, I think. Do you want to show that? How about, <laughs> should we talk or do you want to show something? Um, we do have a four minute presentation in which we showcase a few okay, artworks. Okay, then, then, go, then go ahead. I almost forget, sorry about that. N no worries. Um, yeah, with this presentation, um, I think a lot of people in the room know that we collect, um, that we collect generative art like from this, um, that we collected from, from, from this generation, like we're very active in the current NFT space. Um, but we also wanted to highlight like three, um, I believe, iconic artworks in our collection uh, from, um, generative art pioneers. Uh, the first one is Mondrian. So this was a, is a 30 second uh, excerpt from, from Mondrian uh, by Herbert, um, uh, Herbert Franke. Uh, this was originally created in 1979 um, when the head of um, Texas Instruments Germany uh, commissioned Herbert um, to create uh, a visual arts uh, program uh, for their first home computer, um, the TI-99-4, uh, which will be on the, on the next slide. 
Um, so I think this is one of the most important artworks that we have uh, in our collection. Um, it was also part of the, the ZKM uh, solo exhibition, uh, Wanderer, Wanderer Between the Worlds in 2010. Um, and that's when it was, um, like when this video was captured. Uh, and, and in 2022, it was minted uh, on the Tezos blockchain uh, and we had the, the honor uh, of collecting it. Um, so this, the other artwork that we want to discuss is Homage to Gerhard Richter by Frieder Nake. Uh, I think this is a fantastic, uh, a fantastic example of, of a generative art pioneer uh, embracing um, blockchain, embracing NFTs, uh, because this is actually an on-chain software piece. Uh, so you can watch this piece uh, endlessly and it will never uh, repeat itself. Um, yeah. Can you please it's play running. it? It's running. Okay, it's running. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, this is, um, as you probably know, Frieder um, has a history uh, of, of paying tribute, uh, paying homage, uh, to the, the great uh, modern artists. Um, this one is uh, a homage to the, the Swiss painter uh, Gerhard Richter. And then the next artwork, ah, okay, here it is. Uh, this is the artwork uh, Zero Degrees Equals 45 Degrees by Analivia Cordero uh, from 1974. Uh, in 1974, uh, Cordero uh, developed her own uh, graphical choreography notation, um, which she fed into Fortran uh, and using a mainframe computer, uh, she, yeah, she generated um, a computer dance sequence. Uh, and in this video, it's actually being performed uh, by dancers um, in 1974. Um, so yeah, these are, in my opinion, like three of the most like important artworks that we have in our collection. the graphical notation that she, she used to create these artworks. And I think the next slide has the, uh, so yeah, here's the, the timeline that uh, I've been working on and or we've been doing at Lorandum. So if you're interested, uh, you can scan the QR code or it's timeline.lorandum.art, so pretty easy URL. And yeah, this is the, you can explore the 70,000 year history of generative art. Uh, there's 10 chapters, uh, eight of them are finished. Um, uh, there's, about, there's going to be about a thousand moments. So right now there's already several hundred. So there's a, a plenty to, while, while you wait for chapter nine and 10. <laughs> chapter nine will be out very soon. Uh, it's finished, but I just, I've been waiting to release it. And then chapter 10 uh, will be the last one uh, covering the 2020s. Wonderful. So my last question, as we only have left one, uh, one minute left uh, to Jan, um, you are very young and you have many years ahead uh, to collect. Uh, today, we have a hype that is called artificial intelligence. Uh, how do you see that um, as a collector and le grandant? <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, not easy to answer in one minute, uh, but we are... You we, have to. <laughs> yeah, the, the timer will go off. <laughs> um, but no, we, we, are, we are very fascinated by, by artificial intelligence, like the, all the developments there. Um, I would say we're mostly focused on collecting the artwork from, uh, from artists who have a very deep conversation with the medium, uh, people who have been exploring artificial intelligence uh, for many years, uh, such as Mario Klingemann um, or... Anna Riddler, Memo Acton, like all these names. Uh, these are the artists we focus on most. Um, but we are, we are also interested in collecting art that is made like even with the latest like text to image uh, models. Um, because there's a few artists who do like very interesting conceptual work with these models because they probe the models and they explore their, their, their biases. Um, so yeah, artists such as Linda Dunia or Mina Atairu um, who make like very, critical conceptual work using these new models um, are also ones that we're very excited about. So yeah, we think, yeah, AI art, we're also collecting that. There's still a lot to do in the future. Yeah, definitely. So thanks a lot for you too. It was wonderful to talk to you.